thanks very much. Uh, honor to be here and a tribute to Terence Rudy. And now I have to get used to the system. And yeah, I mean, uh, after the great talks on spec imaging, I have to emphasize a little bit on the advantages of PET. PET, we have a high spatial resolution, high contrast resolution because we have high first pass extraction of ammonia rubidium, high energy level, and robust in price uh, attenuation correction. So um, the sensitivity specificity is uh, around 10, 15% higher than for SPECT. And importantly, it's easy to read for our fellows and residents. And <clears throat> so no surprise, our sensitivity is around 92, specificity 91%. And uh, the advantage, of course, is we can concurrently assess perfusion and fluoroserve. So we can do dynamic imaging. We can see then the radiator rays are coming in the left ventricle and then accumulating in the myocardium with 10 second frames, first two minutes for enthalpy pneumonia. And then we get the extraction fraction from the blood pool into the myocardium. And with the extraction fraction uh, coefficient K1, we can then measure the flow in milliliter per count per minute we, with a two compartment modeling. And so again, you measure the input function, radio tracer comes into the cavity, goes out of the cavity, and then accumulation at the same time, the myocardium, again, extraction fraction, K1 coefficient, two compartment modeling, and we get the flow in milliliter per count per minute. That's a nice case, for example, to illustrate patients with borderline hypercholesterolemia, chest pain comes uh, for PET imaging. Uh, and 13 ammonia stress rest, homogeneous radio trace uptake. I think we can all agree there's no obstructive lesion, so low probability for obstructive lesion. Negative predictive value is 95% to say, okay, there's no flow limiting obstructive lesions. And you see the concurrent measured flow stress is 1.47, should be around 2, so it's certainly reduced. Rest flow is 0.8, flow reserve 1.8, so there is microvascular dysfunction. Patient for uh, different clinical reasons went to the cath and there was no obstructive coronary artery disease lesion, plug in the LID. And after one year, he came back with acute coronary syndrome. Uh, microvascular dysfunction here was, let's say, predictive of coronary artery disease progression and high grade lesion, the LID proximal with uh, ST segment uh, changes, uh, T inversions, acute coronary syndrome. He got a stent and everything was fine. And uh, then we have humorous outcome studies and actually first came from Germany, from Freiburg, from my group, and, but we did with sympathetic stimulation, but we could show that in patients where we had proven um, coronary endothelial dysfunction, uh, that they had a worse outcome and uh, was not easy to publish because at that time everything was about spec and but in the end we got it published and I did these studies also with my co-worker fellow at that time at Freiburg, Freimut Jüngling, who's now at Edmonton. And now we meet again here in Canada. And, uh, and then we did also Johns Hopkins hyperhemic flow heterogeneity in Hockham hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy patients. We could also show the value of flow also in this population. And then of course, the milestone publication from uh, Ciadi from uh, Ottawa Binance Group, we showed very nicely that even if you have uh, ischemia or some stress score more than four, and you see the uh, severe ischemia, but when the fluoroserve is even there, we use the global fluoroserve, then the uh, event rate is goes even up to 25%. And what we need to show is uh, that this event rate in these patients may go down to 10% if you treat them properly with statin uh, angiotensin inhibitors. But these studies uh, intervening with uh, treatment and improving outcome are still missing. So that's what we still need to prove. And uh, then fluoroserve is nonspecific. It can be due to microvascular dysfunction or can be due to obstructive coronary artery disease. So we need a static images to say, okay, there's obstructive or no obstructive coronary artery disease. And then when we know there's a homogeneous uh, static, static image uh, on stress, then we can say, okay, there's no obstructive coronary lesion. Then we can focus on the microcirculation. And there's now also a case added value of fluoroserve, regional fluoroserve, patient with uh, ischemia anteropically. There's a reversibility in the anteropical region. Not so um, 
uh, inferior and lateral seems to be normal. And then in the cath lab, or as expected, the LID is occluded. But you see also there's a LCX stenosis of 80%. And exactly there, the flow, regional flow, segmental flow, shows floral surface reduced 1.41. So that means this lesion is also significant. And then also in the RSA, there were three lesions, zero lesions, around 50%. I can say, okay, borderline, but they are zero lesions. And we know from the cat lab, these uh, stenoses add up. So also functional significant lesion. So if you go back on the static images, they commonly show the advanced lesion, but not necessarily the intermediate lesions uh, of, like we see here in the L6 and zero lesions in the RSA. So in this patient, he was initially scheduled to, for reopening of the LID. But when we discuss that in the meeting and say, okay, there's also clearly reduction in floral surf in all three vessels with stenosis, or then patient went to cabbage. So adding the floral surf, regional floral surf, is also helpful then uh, for the intervention cardiologist and cardiovascular surgeon uh, when the patient goes to the cath lab or when the case is being discussed uh, for cardiovascular surgery. And then, of course, now we focus a bit, or let's say that way, Microvascular dysfunction is a huge area now that is opening up because we can treat microvascular dysfunction. It's present about, let's say we have cath in, the, let's say in US, with non-obstructive coronary disease are in about 40 to 60 percent, and in this population around 30 percent you have microvascular dysfunction. So a substantial portion of patients with non-obstructive coronary disease they have chest pain, which may come from microvascular dysfunction, which can be treated. And then, uh, yeah, especially in St. Louis in Missouri, we have high uh, BMI population. The mean BMI in uh, Missouri is around uh, 29. And uh, so we have much trouble with attenuation uh, problems with SPECT and SPECT-CT. And there, PET-CT proves to be really beneficial in these patients. That's what the insurance also cover then in Missouri. And then also insurance company cover patients who have known coronary disease and um, when uh, they have again chest pain after cabbage intervention and they are paired with the segmental regional flow perfusion flow quantification is really beneficial and then of course it's easier to identify diffuse balanced ischemia especially with gated wall motion assessment and then the huge portion now is microvascular disease where also the insurances are opening up to cover this <coughs> And again, in really difficult population, PET, rubidium PET has a high sensitivity and specificity. It's easy to read. And now again, in about 4 million of symptomatic patients in the US, uh, they do not have obstruct, uh, they come in the cath lab in about 60% of them, they have no obstructive coronary disease. So the idea of the Medicare Medicaid in the US is also with high diagnostic accuracy of PET to reduce this number of um, non uh, of let's say wouldn't say false positive findings but patients who go maybe unnecessarily to the cath lab and uh, and to provide high quality care so now you can also imagine when you have a patient with a non-obstructive coronary disease and he has chest pain now you see this network of micro circulatory uh, distribution if this is not working patients really can have chest pain even if there's no obstructive coronary disease lesions. And of course, uh, microvascular dysfunction may have functional structural and uh, myocardial causes, hypertrophic obstructive coronary, uh, cardiomyopathy, we see in one third of patients really severe microvascular dysfunction. Then patients with hypertension, diabetes, they have also stiffening of the coronary vessels of the microcirculation over time. And then of course, a certain percent of patients, they have even it's a vasoconstriction in the microcirculation. And so that's a huge field. And the problem is still how to diagnose and report these uh, findings. We had an expert panel, which was also presided by Terence uh, von Swartz and uh, Prem. And uh, we have to keep in mind the fluoroserf can be reduced either to reductions in hypermic flow, because the vessels are stiff, they cannot open up during uh, stress increase in flow. Uh, due to uh, cardio, classical cardiovascular risk factors, but myocardial fluoroserf can also be abnormal, less than two, because patients have hypertension, 
why uh, the myocardium has to contract against a high resistance to for the stroke volume in the aorta and for that it needs more oxygen supply so what it's doing it's opening the microcirculation to pull more volume into the heart to meet the oxygen demand increased oxygen demand in the myocytes and the rest flow goes up but you see when the flow reserve uh, ratio uh, stress flow divided by rest flow when the resting flow goes up then the vessels are already dilated and now the patient has a stress test but the vessels are already dilated at rest so it cannot further open the vessels cannot further increase the flow and uh, then you can imagine a patient with hypertension going up two flights of stairs he may have a chest pain and shortness of breath and that's related to microvascular dysfunction and now that's the case with classical coronary microvascular dysfunction. So you see the hypermic flow should be more than two, um, but it's here 1.23. Rest flow is also still borderline normal for our lab. It's 1.2 and the flow reserve is one. So this patient has really classical microvascular dysfunction, mainly due to reduction in hypermic flow. And now we have the endogenous or endogen coronary microvascular dysfunction. A patient with hypertension, and you see the resting flow is 1.52 milliliter per gram per minute, should be less than 1.1. In our lab is, lab is between 0.8 to 1.1. And uh, this patient had uh, arterial blood pressure around 160 systolic. And you see also the hypermic flow, flow is completely normal, 2.34. So there's no vessel stiffness or any problem with the conductance prop, uh, vessels or my, uh, flow to the heart. The problem is patient's hypertension, resting flow is up, cannot further dilate the vessels during stress tests, and he has also chest pain and shortness of breath. And it's important that the referring physician knows that. So he knows uh, what to treat. He needs to bring down the resting flow. He needs to probably treat the hypertension and improve the remodeling in the myocardium. Conversely, when you have a patient with uh, predominant classical, uh, classical microvascular dysfunction, you rather go for the vessel function. So you give uh, angiotensin inhibitor and uh, also statin to improve the vasoreactivity of the microcirculation. While in this patient with high increase in resting flow, you may give better blocker, reduces the heart rate, also the blood pressure. Then the flow goes down from 1.5 maybe to 0.9 and patient has the normal flow reserve again, normal microvascular function. So if you don't make this separation to say classical microvascular function or endogenous microvascular dysfunction, um, then it may be difficult for the referring physician to make a good treatment decision. And that's uh, published in Czech cardiovascular imaging. So you can dive in that uh, document and I think it's very helpful. And then we have also the abrupt use criteria where Prem, uh, Ron, and also Terry again was very instrumental to bring that out. And these are the first uh, 211 clinical scenarios that give advice in the United States when and how to use uh, cardiac PET perfusion and flow. And then of course, uh, PET uh, can also assess uh, coronary uh, physiology. We do also some research and uh, it may be helpful to complement and to contrast experimental studies because we do in vivo imaging we assess the response of the tissue not just cell to cell but also tissue response and uh, it may be helpful to provide mechanistic insight what is causing microvascular dysfunction what is causing coronary disease where we can intervene with intervention and we did study uh, when i still was in geneva uh, and could, could show that the release of endocannabinoids from the adipose tissue causes a dysfunction of the coronary circulation. So when you have increasing body weight, it's not just classical risk factors like hypercholesterolemia, uh, hypertension, smoking. No, our own body, our own uh, adipose tissue is releasing adipose cytokines that affect or may promote coronary artery disease. And interestingly, in morbid obesity, this may also switch. And there, um, as you can see in normal obesity, increases in uh, endocannabinoid or leptin or CRP 
co-linear with reduced endothelial function. And when it goes to morbid obesity, everything switches because the metabolic profile changes. And then inflammation is even associated with better uh, endothelial function. Probably it's not inflammation itself, but uh, factors responding to inflammation from the adipose tissue that maintain endothelial function. And we did study also the advantage in Missouri is we get really many patients with BMI range from 40 to 55. And so we could show and demonstrate that in increase with increasing body weight initially, the flow, high brain flow goes down to ob uh, overweight uh, obesity, classical obesity, but then it normalizes again in morbidly obesity. And uh, we could show the paradox uh, in coronary vascular function in obesity. You see the curve correlates nicely with decrease in flow, but in obesity it goes up again. And the, the reason is in uh, obesity, morbid obesity, you have completely different metabolic profile. In obesity, it's more cardiovascular risk profile for the vessel because visceral tissue releases oxidative stress, free fat acid goes to the liver, causes an increase in, hyper in cholesterol and uh, LDL. And then when patients switch to morbid OACC, that changes completely. There's no further worsening of the lipid profile the, because of certain substances that are released from the adipose tissue like leptin, ghrelin. But also the, uh, the insulin sensitivity increases also paradoxically. So in, very often in these patients, you don't find coronary calcification on the CT scan from the PET and everyone is surprised. Uh, but the downside is there may be certain protection against coronary disease, but leptin and other adipose cytokines promote uh, left front ventricular hypertrophy in a situified process, promoting in the end uh, diastolic dysfunction and congestive heart failure. So uh, uh, that's the downside. So in any instance, you have to lose weight. <laughs> and uh, we could also show in uh, patients with COVID uh, that they have. Uh, endothelial dysfunction by measuring the longitudinal flow gradient. You see on the right hand side, there's a striking de a decrease in longitudinal flow uh, in patients with COVID that was not observed in uh, non-COVID patients and controls. Uh, so we could uh, demonstrate that really COVID affects endothelial function and also the flow reserve. And then the interesting case, a uh, 37-year-old woman with ex uh, exertional dyspnea, uh, arterial hypertension, risk factors, comes for a PET. And now we see the rest images and third in ammonia. That, uh, we see already it's a little bit suspicious, but the rest images, but I keep it for myself. Uh, probably the experts see what is happening there. But you see then on stress images, there's... Uh, reversibility in the LID distribution, infraepical, uh, anteropical, but also TID. So nicely on the polar map and flow reserve is reduced. Decrease in ejection fraction from 52 to 27. Oh, everyone thinks that's diffuse ischemia. Okay, it's diffuse ischemia. Probably say, oh, probably left main three vessel disease. Other suggestions? No, it's Hocken, hypertrophic yeah. obstructive cardiomyopathy. In this patient, had also a cath before, there was no coronary disease. So this uh, myocardial stunning or diffuse ischemia came from the uh, Hocken, meaning the myocardial wall thickening was more than 25 millimeter. You can see that. And you can also imagine if you have a minor, minor disbalance between stress uh, flow uh, between oxygen demand and supply that there is immediately severe ischemia at microcirculatory level that causes decrease in ejection fraction. Patient goes up to a flight of stairs, has shortness of breath, chest pain. Yeah, and so, and I think this kind uh, we can identify, especially with PET and flow quantification, also in transplant vasculopathy and really patients with severe uh, LVH. And now, uh, yeah, Terence, Terry, uh, you're, I think, one of the few and unique clinician scientists who can truly witness his own work be translated from basic research to clinical application worldwide, spec to pet. 
Legion in cardiovascular medicine, Congrats, Terry, and Riding High, in, especially in uh, Arabia on the camel. Thank you very much. <laughs>